Good, good, good to hear it. Hope you're doing great because you need to get in a good mood because you're going to have rain all week. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Like we haven't had enough yet this season. Some of us, I'm glad you're with us today. We, see we have a few visitors today. Um, I know for a couple of different things and reasons. A lot of our families out already traveling this week. We want to be in remembrance of them as they're getting around, uh, being prayer for my family. We will be uh, traveling this week as well, being prayer for us that we are safe and sound and that we get a good little bit of rest here before we have to start back things up here in the week. Uh, but if you're visiting today, my name is Jody May. I'm the lead teaching pastor here at Highlands. So great to have you here today with us. Hope you enjoy your time and our gathering this morning. If you have a Bible, if you want to use it, we have some sitting back up there on the sound booth. Uh, but we'll have the, the scripture on the screens for you today. As well, if you're just checking in today, want to know where we're at. We're in the middle of, uh, of a sermon series from the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And as we've been following Jesus now, as he started his ministry, guys, if you remember what we've been talking about, Jesus has now done his preaching gig in the north. He has now confronted the Pharisees. He has hacked them all off, right? He has now uh, gotten to the point, if you remember the story last week, that they, after he had totally messed up the Sabbath, healed the guy in front of them, said, whether you like it or not, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It is my right. And at this point, uh, those in opposition to him were planning to kill him. So this is where we're at in the story. It's starting to get high tension, right? It's like a good movie, good thriller. So what is the Lord going to do? Well, today's story is the first response to that opposition. How will he handle these things? And that's what you're going to see in the text in these days. What is going to happen next? And, and in that, for us as a church, how he handles it is the lesson for us today that we need to pay attention to. How will we handle things when we begin to come against the opposition of the world, right? So that's what you're about walking into. So whether you've been in here before Luke or you're just stepping in today, today's a great message from you from God himself through the power of the Spirit, right? So with that, let's go ahead and uh, let's pray this morning and ask God to bless us because if it has anything to do with me, it's not going to be great. It's got to be God. It's got to be God. So let's go ahead and go to him in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain. We thank you that you're the one that provides life in all things. And we are thankful so much for the Son who has given us life that we may glorify you. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we ask would be here today to anoint the preaching of your word, to open up deaf ears so, or so we may hear who you are, see who you are, God, experience the glory of you, so that we may leave here changed to be witnesses and testimonies to the world of the God that we serve. May we bear that name well for you when we leave today. Father, would you please show us the message today of the importance and the necessity of of prayer. So Lord, come and make your presence known to us today. For we pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us start with the reading of God's word this morning. Beginning in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12 going through verse 16. And it reads like this. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. This is God's word that is so profitable for us. Amen. So in that, let me kind of start off today in our discussion about the necessity of prayer in some places I was this week. I came across some decisions this week, guys, that I had to start thinking about. Normal life things, normal things I think you'll be able to compare them to your lives. But here are some of the things that I came across this week, things that were not everyday normal, just things I had to think about. One, number one was this. And you're going to be like, oh, really, Jody? Is, is I was started thinking about, as I talked with Chris Cook, about finishing my basement. Not a big deal, right? But I had to start thinking about, like, well, do I really want to, number one, do I want to spend the money? Do I, how much of the basement do I want to spend? What do I want it to look like when we're done, right? And do I really want to take on another task in my life when I'm extremely busy, right? That's a normal everyday decision, right? 
just not an all the time thing, but it's something I came across this week. Another decision um, I've started looking at lately, um, just in the simple signing up of my daughter to take her SATs in school this year, she has started receiving every kind of postcard mailer from every school in the country, right? Uh, I would like to say it's because she's my daughter, that's why, but I can't say that yet. Next year I can do that. But in that, I and mean, she blows the SAT out of the water, right? But in that, it's got me sort of thinking this week, like, I have to start making decisions about how do I want to start guiding her toward what school to, to, to pick, or how, how fast can I get her out of the house, right? You know, hey, parents, you know what I'm feeling, right? So, so I had to start thinking about those things. For my son, Avery, today, he had an opportunity to go into a wrestling tournament, right? So I had to think about this week, do I really want to send him on a Sunday? Do I really want to go through all that? What does that mean? If he does go, does he qualify for certain things? So I had to go through that process in my mind. My, my littlest one, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassing everybody today. My littlest one this week came to us with a little de- dilemma that she's been going through. She has a little dance cl- class that she likes to participate after school program. She didn't really want to do it anymore. She told about some of the reasons. One of her friends dropped out of it. And she was like back and forth about does she want to do it. And Heather and I had to start having discussions. Well, should she be doing it or not? So, and then here, Heather and I were, were talking this week here bring us all into this conversation, right? Because this is just like your life, right? In that, we started talking about, again, do we, we need to start saving for retirement again. We hadn't done it for a few years. We had done it before we moved to Georgia. We, we started getting into it again. And who do we want to use? And, and how much money are we going to start doing? And how are we going to do that? So those were just, just normal, everyday occurrences, right? Family stuff that you all have to go through. Now, all, all these things, while it seems out of, nothing out of the ordinary, here, now listen, here's where I failed this week. I want to tell you where I failed a little bit over him. I never took at one time any of these decisions to God. I didn't take any of these things to God. Now, now, why should I? They're just everyday decisions, right? Like you're thinking it, I'm thinking it, like, well, do you really need to pray about that stuff right now, right yet? Is it serious? I should pray about things in my home that pertain to God, his kingdom, helping my family become disciples, but then I remembered something about discipleship. Help me out here. You should be amen to me. The practice of leading. The practice of developing next generation leadership. Mentoring for my family. Modeling the things of God for next generation and for my wife as well as I am her spiritual leader. Discipleship is not a program. Discipleship is not a class. Discipleship is not just about devotion time. Discipleship is an all-of-life event. Amen? Amen. Everything we do is about discipling one another. And in that, you see, I forgot. I forgot about that. I forgot that the basement, it's it's more important than just like, what am I doing with my money? It's like, why are we using it? Why am I doing that? See, one of the reasons I know in the back of my head that I should have been praying about is because I want to do this because I want to create space for my youth that I'm getting to teach right now so that they can come over and hang out and we can bring the lost, their friends there so we can hang out together. The same thing with adults so we have a space to use so that we have an office space for the church that we can use, right? So that I can have the guys over my house of this church and we can meet on those things. It's for ministry purposes. Did you think I prayed about it or thought about it this week? No. Was it worth praying about? Or my daughter, my oldest one, about college. Did I even go to God about that this week? Because those are going to be some of the most important years of her life as she begins honing her skills and her gifts to use for God's glory in the future. You think I should pray about that? How about my son? Oh, big deal. He missed a wrestling match today. Or did I teach him the value of it's more important to be with God's people on Sunday? That's what really matters. Or with my youngest one. Does that she learns, like, what, what's the importance of her staying in that class or not? Is it to teach her the character trait of endurance? Because endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does that what, folks? doesn't fail you. What about retirement accounts? What, why should I pray about those? Well, is it about trusting God as we get older? How much money do we really need to save for retirement? Do we act by greed or do we trust God for our future? Do we save some and we just be smart so that we can put more into ministry use now? How do we make those decisions? Are we going to God with our hearts? See, all those things had to do with God, didn't they? Not one of them should I have neglected to pray about. 
All of these things do deal with God's kingdom. And they are things that need to be offered to God so that our relationship can develop with our Lord, so mine and His and my family, that His glory is increased and my joy grows. That's how it works, you know, according to catechism, right? What is the chief end of man? To glorify Him and enjoy Him for what? Forever. It starts with prayer. So here's the real question right now. How can I not pray about those things? If this is how I'm supposed to enjoy him, to see him move through prayer. Here's what we're all falling, failing to learn in life, and as the church is crucial to relearn this fact right now. So in your bulletins this morning, I put the main point, but here's the point, hopefully, that the Spirit drives home for me and for you this morning as well. Here's the main point is prayer is not a way to live in and for God's kingdom. It is the way. Prayer is not a way to live in and for God's kingdom. It's not a way to live as a Christian. It is the way to do it. It is the only way to do it. So here's prayer according to the Baptist Catechism or Keech's Catechism. Question 109 from that says, ask the question, what is prayer? Here is the answer. Prayer is an offering up of our desires to God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Amen? This is in your program today. I want you to go home. I want you to look at those verses. I want you to discuss them with your family. And please understand what prayer is and talk about are we even praying in the right way when we do pray. We'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. Prayer is not just a way, it is the way. And as it is with anything that is important with your life, know this, prayer is not to be tacked onto the back of a task to make it an endeavor that's successful, to make it go good. But it is the task that God calls us to. Can I say that again? Prayer is not the thing you just use to tack on to a task that you want to do to hopefully it makes it successful. But what God is calling us as a people to do is pray. That is the task. We are to offer our desires up to God, as it says in that question. The translation is, it is something you should want to do. And if you have something you want to do, you should be praying about it. So here's, he's the one that makes anything successful, not us. For you see, I think we forget the gospel. The gospel says that he is the one that is working to make all things new. Revelation 21.5, Jesus. That's not our job. That's his job. We are called to pray for this reason, so that he may receive the glory. And upon seeing him glorified, you get joy. Without prayer, God gets no credit from us. It'll never get credit from the world unless we pray so that the world can't see us praying for things and see answers. It'll ne the world will acknowledge him. There is no relation with him being built unless you start talking to him and he's answering you as a good and loving father. There's no relationship skills that you are honing. We receive no true lasting joy from our life for now all outcomes, if you don't pray, have no correlation to God. They're either chaos or they're chance. See, if we don't pray, how can you tie anything in your life to God? You're just guessing. And what we typically do as human beings is that when things go good, we give that to God. And when things are bad, we think he doesn't love us. That's absurd. But we do it, don't we? Do you know why we do that? It's because we don't pray enough. We're not tying in these things, the requests to God, and we're not building the relationship. And we're not struggling and we're not wrestling with, is it his will or my will? That's why we need to pray. He's the one that makes it successful, not us. Prayer acknowledges God for all things. Your requests and your praises, period. That's how it works. So in our passage today, we're going to see a simple formula for prayer. Listen, guys, I could teach you everything from the Bible about prayer, and we would be here for the next 20 hours. Don't think you want to do that today. It's really deserving of a book or, or a series or a class. But all I want to do today, because it's in our text and we're hitting it in Luke. See, that's one of the cool things when you get to teach expositorily in the text. It's what God wants you to teach that day. And you're going to hit it. We're going to run with it, right? So in the, in the text today, 
what we're going to see is a formula, a formula that is performed by our Lord. And in anything that Jesus does, you know that we should do it as well, right? It is something to emulate. We are in his image. We are the reflection of his glory. We should take this formula and we should run with it. So, so is, that, is there all the little ins and outs of prayers? And how do you do it? And how do you say it? Should everything be in Jesus' name? And what's the model of the Lord's Prayer? And how does that work? Yes, those are all good questions. But today, we're just looking at the, here's the A plus B equals C. That's what we're looking at, okay? So that's in the text today. We're, that's what we'll be talking about. So in our passage today, you'll see this formula played out by Jesus when it came to one of the most important decisions in his life. This is a big one. This is not something small because it dealt with the future of us, the church. You will see in the text today what Christ goes through. And that little text we just read affects you sitting here right now. If he did not do this, you and I might not be here. Right here, right now. This is all about him saving us 2,000 years ago through his work. So in that, this is the choosing of the 12 disciples, the apostles, because Jesus knows this simple fact. Prayer is not a thing you do for God's kingdom. He knew it was the thing you do for God's kingdom. So in that, here's the first thing that we see in the text today. This morning, and you'll know this, and this is the one that gets all of us. Number one is this, make time to pray. You have to make time to pray. Or should I say, you set aside time to pray. Look back at your text this morning. Verse 12, it reads like this. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. First thing you want to notice in that text is, in these days. What does he mean? Sounds like a soap opera, right? Like the days of our lives. I hate to admit it, I used to actually watch that in college. But that's another story. I know, I know. It's because when I went to school, they actually had people my same age. Okay, that's a long story. All right, so anyways. Uh, so this phrase, though, tells us this particular time that Jesus chose to pray. Why? Because it was about something about those days. He pulled away to do this task. What have we just studied tells us, though, that this is the escalation to opposition. These days means what just happened, right? What did Luke just describe is all of his Sabbath work and the confrontation with the Pharisees. It's in these days that Jesus pulled away and said, whoa, slow this thing down. Slow this down. The Pharisees have declared an all-out war what we saw last week on Jesus. Because remember, they were discussing for what to do with him, which really meant, according to the other Gospels, they were planning to kill him. And Jesus has now seen in his belief from Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, because the Lord believes, our Lord believes the scripture even when we don't, he knows it's time for him to start looking at his death. It's not that they're doing what's wrong. Jesus gets this. They are doing, they are fulfilling my father's will. I know this is coming. It is now time to start planning because no one takes my life unless I lay it down. So it's got to be the way I want it. You see, this is important. This is a plan. This is the planning of God's sovereignty, his providence. This is all about our salvation, the future of the church. In these days, Jesus is feeling the pressure. This has got to happen right. Are you getting the pressure now? This is it. So Jesus now knows the clock is ticking and that his death and resurrection is only half of the plan. It's the full plan for our salvation needed, but there have got to be some guys that when he's gone, carry out the plan. It has come time to pick the new, listen to me, this is big, the new representative figures of Israel. The 12 apostles are to become the new 12 leaders because the clans have now are done. Guess this is what this means. Jesus has rejected Judaism. He has rejected temple. He has rejected the worship there because it's false. He already tried to clear it out a year earlier in John, if you read about that. He's rejected the priests. He's rejected the Pharisees. He saw that they are not able to follow what he's doing. He is now picking the new 12 leaders. That's why the symbolic number is there of the leaders of Israel. That's huge stuff. This is going to have eternal ramifications in heaven one day. I dare say that you will have be in some clan and one of these guys will be your leader. Think about it. All in Jesus' name. 
So, in this, it's come time to pick. It's come time to pray for those that will stay behind and become the fathers of the church. And as he said to Peter, as he will say, and upon this rock, the apostles, I will build my church. We see this next phrase in this verse here. And all night he continues in prayer. Kai, don't hold this against me. I'm going to try to read this as good as I can because I practice actually saying this. It's, uh, it's Dianuk Terero. It's in Greek. That's why it sounds like that. I don't really talk like that. But in that, it's a, it's a kind of a curious word. It is the only time you find this word in the New Testament. One time. They use it one time. That means it specifically was picked by Luke for this occasion. Okay? It's just, and it, it basically meant to spend the whole night. So here's the, the weight of that. Jesus didn't just spend the night on the mountain and prayed while he was awake. Or while he was in and out thinking about things. The intent is here that he prayed all night long. When the sun went down until it came up, he was in prayer. Have anybody in here ever prayed like that before? We can't keep our mind focused for 10 minutes in prayer, can we? He does it for hours. This guy is focused, man. I'm so glad I have Jesus, aren't you? He does things that we cannot do. And at this point in the gospel, the prayer of Jesus seems very obvious because Luke had highlighted with this term. There's an obviousness to why he's pointing this out. But, as so often the case, when reading the gospels, listen to me, we oftentimes eisegete on the text. We, we put a belief on the text instead of letting the text read, and then we take from it. We oftentimes go to it and we throw beliefs on the text. Listen, this is how this works a lot of times. And, and what we do is we, we put a, un, a belief on the text about what we already think about Jesus. I, I, we tend to forget an important aspect of Jesus' ministry on earth. You guys, you've got to remember, according to Philippians 2.8, Jesus had put down his divine power to come to us. When Jesus is born, unlike Superman's story, I was talking about someone today, he doesn't have his powers. There's no, I could just plug into my cosmic power and do what I want at any moment. That is not what the Bible tells us, according to Philippians. His divine power, and, and he lives as we do in the power of the Holy Spirit, which came upon him at his baptism. In Luke 3, we read that, right? You saw it come down from heaven like a dove, and he prayed, and God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember the coronation event? That was it. So that would mean, listen to me, this is the importance of it. That would mean that everything Jesus does, everything must first be established by prayer and that his communication with the Father only happens through prayer. Jesus doesn't have this automatic, I think it, he thinks it, he thinks it, I thinks it. No, the Lord had given them a task. You must live as they do and you must pray, Jesus. And that is how Jesus communicates with his Father. It's no different than what you and I do. You need to understand that. Because oftentimes when we read the text, we just think he's got instant communication whenever he wants. If he wants to eat, he just says, boom. It's like Star Trek. The food just appears, right? And he eats. That's not how this relationship works. He is like us. He is also the son of man, divine, and also the representative. He is of the flesh. Fully, divine, fully God, but fully man. So he is doing life as we are supposed to do life, showing what should be a should be and perfectly accomplishing it. We were meant to live like that, by the way. In the beginning, Adam and Eve prayed, and it was like this. And they actually, they had it easier than Jesus because their will was in perfect harmony with God because everything was good for them. Jesus had it rough his whole life and still accomplished through prayer. That's your God. Jesus is spending time with God to search for the agreement of wills, and he is acting out on those decisions. Let me just remind you of three instances where we have kind of probably maybe overlooked it in the text, where we kind of said, well, I don't know how Jesus is doing this. I mean, he just, he's just Jesus. He's got power. He's got like a battery pack on his back. So when he's healing, he's just sucking into that. He's just healing people. He's just doing things as he wants because he's Jesus. Absolutely, he's Jesus, and he is the king, but he's not doing this without the Father's will. Let me remind you of three different accounts here, right? Remember in chapter 3, Jesus goes out into the wilderness after 322, after being baptized. And how long does he fast? 40 days. Do you know what you do with fasting? You pray. That's why you fast. 40 days he prays. 
and fast and conquers the devil while he's out there so that when he returns from this, he begins his ministry. How important was that for our Lord to get away, wrestle with God's will, his will? Lord, you have just crowned me as the Messiah. What do you want me to do? You want me to, get, you want me to take this right now? No, Jesus, it's time to start learning how to die. And he prays 40 days. Then in 442 in Luke, in our story, he went away to a desolate place to pray again. And the people found him. Do you remember that? He had been doing work. He'd been preaching in the north, been doing some healings, right? Showing people who he was, explaining to people who in his own town kicked him out. And then he had pulled away again and they came to him again. And right when he came back after going with his will to the Father and praising God for what he was doing, what's he do after that? He picks Peter, James, and John, the leaders. Calls them, follow me. He believes what he's been called to do and he starts picking the disciples. And then we see in 516, just a little while ago, he is seen praying right before he begins to confront the Pharisees. Guys, what we see here is Jesus began, he comes away, he begins to wrestle with God again about his will and God's will. He's going through it and he prays in his desolate place so that when he comes back, he doesn't try to work it with the Pharisees. He doesn't try to get along with the Pharisees. He starts antagonizing them because he's starting to believe these are the guys who are going to put me down. Every one of those things, Jesus didn't choose to do it without God's will. He didn't heal without God, his Father's will. It was all done by the power of prayer, and we totally missed it. Jesus knows that it's not just a way to do things. He knows it's the way to do things, and we don't do that. Because so many times we just think, well, wouldn't it be cool like Jesus if we were just plugged into the power all the time to work like that? Jesus never did that. He did it just like we do. He prayed, and then he acted, and then he trusted God for the results. So you see, I think as a church, we overlook what Jesus is doing with prayer because we think he acts on his own. And instead of reading it, we just read our wants into it. He prays and acts. So the simple thing we need to walk away with here is this, is that we make time for prayer. Guess what? Because he made time for prayer. It's a simple thing, right? It's a simple formula. Why should we pray? Because he did. And he's Jesus. He's perfect. Do I think I need that much more prayer? Hallelujah, right? I know I do. Prayer is not the thing we tack on the end of a thing. It's the thing we do first, and it is the thing that we're called to do. So what can you start doing to make it first? I gave you some examples in your bulletin today, so you won't have to write these down. They're not going to be on the screen. I just gave them because I just want to talk about them. I want to hit them real quick, and I want to move on. Some thoughts, some challenges. Number one, I, I said, hey, how about we make a schedule for it and make it a habit of doing it before things? Is that is, it, is that, that hard to do? Can you put it into your planning and your daily routines, times to actually pray? Well, Jordy, now you're becoming all about the rules. No, I'm not. I'm becoming about that's the way we should be doing things. It's the way we should be doing things. How about make it a habit in your home before you... I thought this was crazy, right? I mean, like, you're just nuts. You don't have kids. I'm going to go, booyah, I do have kids. Why don't you make it a habit, instead of doing it right before you sit down to eat, make it a habit to do it before you cook dinner. Now, why? Well, because I thought about it today. Like, wouldn't it be kind of cool to... You get home, it's 5.30, and you know it's busy because you're trying to get dinner ready. I know, right? We're all trying to get dinner ready. You're trying to bathe. You're trying to do homework, right? How about, how about the house just stops? And as a family, we come together and we go, let's recognize God for his goodness. Let's recognize him for the food that he's about to make for us. Let's thank him for everybody got home safe today. Let's thank him there were no school shootings at my school today. Let's thank him for the opportunities we had to share the gospel today. Let's pray for those who are getting sick right now. And you do it right then. Then when the food is done, you can simply sit down at the meal and start eating. And as you're eating, rejoice and give Jesus thanks for it. See, oftentimes, and I don't know where we got, came up with this, that oftentimes many of us, we treat, and we show this to our kids, it's a pain in the butt to pray before you eat because you're keeping me from having my satisfaction. How about we start doing it way earlier to teach our kids what we're thankful for? Just, just an opportunity. Just, just something to think about, right? How about we make it a habit to pray on the way to school, work, and before you enter back into the home, in your cars, when you're driving your kids to school, pray with them. 
Doesn't have to be long, but set it up. It's something we do because it's the thing for the kingdom, right? It's not a thing, it's the thing. Or more importantly, you need to make time away in quietness for bigger prayers in life because prayer is the action of wrestling your will with submission to God's will. Listen, the action of prayer is about you going to God. As I was talking with somebody else in the body today, it's the thing that we do so we can begin to speak out loud. I think that's why Jesus went away by himself because he probably, if we probably would have seen Jesus back in those days, he'd be like, that guy's crazy. Because he probably would have been like, Lord, Lord, like what's going on, right? And, and, and talking with God, not in anger, but like talking it out. Because see, what happens when you talk your prayers out loud, your ears are picking up on what you're saying. And you'll start saying, that sounds a lot like me, not like God. And you'll actually catch yourself in your prayers asking for things you know. You know, Lord, I am talking way too much about myself. I've not even asked what you want today. Sorry, Lord, can you forgive me? Or Lord, I keep asking for that thing, but maybe it's just not time for that thing. Or maybe you don't even want me to have that thing. Let me get off that thing. Whatever that is. Don't get by yourself at least once a week. Talk it out loud with the Lord and allow him to correct your heart. Prayer is not a thing. It is the thing we do. We've got to become people like this. So, moving on. Here's the second thing in the formula we see today. Jesus spends all night, because it was on these days that he went up there, very important thing, and what you do next? He moves with resolve. He moves with resolve. I like it. He comes out of the mountain, there's no hesitation. I've got an announcement to make everybody, here's what we're doing. I like that, Jesus, don't you? Verse 13, it says, And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. That's big right there. We'll get to that in a second. And Jesus spent his time well, and when he was done praying, he doesn't hesitate, but he goes down and goes with a decision. We've come to a conclusion. Here's where we're going. You know, these things in your life that you're neglecting to do, family, I don't know what, you probably all got something you're procrastinating on, right? Let me ask you a question. Could that be because you're not praying about it? Or you're not sharing with him what is your will? You're kind of hiding it from him. It's easy for me to say, though, right? Well, it worked for Jesus. He didn't procrastinate. He just came down made it happen. As a matter of fact, I feel pretty secure in making this point to you to move and resolve after you pray because I know even if you're misinterpreting God at a time in your life, what he wants for you, on a situation perhaps, but God, I know this, gives grace to those who seek him. That's biblical. He gives you grace. You're not going to mess up your life. God's desire is that you know him. So the invite to prayer is the invite to fail underneath his direction. Man, I want that one because I never got that growing up. I want a father like this. Remember in Proverbs, it reads like this, 817, it says this. I love those who love me. And what's he say? And those who seek me diligently, what? Find me. Those who pray. Those who pray, wrestle with their will, with my will, and seek me, they will find me. How many of y'all want that promise today? Look, any problem you came in with today, whether you're a Christian or not, you go to church, you don't, let me tell you what you need is the most is to find God. Pray. Seek him, and you will find him. Jesus is fully aware of this fact. He knows the scripture. He trusts in God's love and trusts the guidance of the spirit. And he makes a huge decision. The word apostle here, right? Apple means to come out from and stello means to send. Apostle. That means to, quite literally, Jesus picked guys that would speak for him, meaning they would carry the full weight of the kingdom of God to do what he will do. It will have to do it like him. And when he is gone, all by the power of the Holy Spirit through prayer. Here's the equivalent. In, the, in those days, here's what an apostle was. This is not a word we use much. Matter of fact, if, you, if we use that word nowadays because of church tradition, you would think I'm a heretic and we need to kick him out, right? So if I ever start calling Jared my apostle, you're like, whoa, 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 hold on, right? That's, that's a wrong thing in church tradition. But in those days, apostle wasn't just religious terms. It was the guy who spoke as the king of ambassadors. I want to bring up something for you men in here. You will recognize this example. In the movie The 300, King Leonis, right? The guy from Persia, the ambassador comes. And he says, if you will bow down to who? Me, not the guy coming. Bow down to me and we can get over this. And what is the king's choice? 
This is what, man? Boom. And when he kicks the guy over into the pit, that is the insult of slapping the king because the king didn't send any more emissaries, did he? It was war. That is an apostle. He's been giving full authority. Matter of fact, you know in scripture, the keys of heaven and hell have been given to the apostles. This is, they are under the same provisions. Jesus has given them what the Father had given him. Jesus will be turning over the reins to these guys in just two years. Listen to me, this is the, the ridiculous thought about this. This is something I would never do. In two years, Jesus has given these guys full power and he hasn't even known them a year yet. How many of y'all would do that? Not just your family control, everything in the future for your family. I'm going to give it to you. Impossible, right? But Jesus knows this. Prayer is not a way, it's the way you do it, and I'm going to have some resolve in this. I'm going to trust my God in this. If Jesus can move with this much resolve, if he trusts God that much and was right, then we can trust Jesus and move with resolve in our lives as well. Listen, in your, again, in your bulletin, I give you some examples. How about some things like this? Make decisions with confidence after you pray. Make some decisions after confidence. I know a lot of us have a lot of hard things to go through. Like I talked about earlier, retirement accounts, schooling, and all those type of things, right? Make some decisions with confidence. Do you know how many times I find in our lives when I talk to you guys and I examine my own life most of all, do you know why we don't move confidently after we pray? It's because we're not really sharing with God the things that we want to do, do we? Matter of fact, we, we are people who move with great confidence for things that we don't pray about because it's the things that we want to do. It's, it's opposite, isn't it? We always are fine doing what we want to do with confidence. It's that when we pray, we don't know if we really want to do that because is that really what God wants me to do? And we always debate with him. We have no issue doing what we want with confidence, yet it should be reversed. It's the things that we go to God with in prayer that we should come out of prayer and go with confidence with. And the things that you don't go with God, you better just put that on the back burner. Save yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of time. How about this? How about we take some chances for the sake of Christ? That neighbor that you know does not want to come to your house to have dinner with you because they know you go to church, invite them and pray and move with resolve. How about decide to do difficult and strange because that's how kingdom people roll? Do you know that you and I are supposed to be different from the world? We are holy and set apart. Kingdom people do th weird things. I, I hate to tell you this. Yes, you're a little weird to the world. Get used to it because that's how the world notices God. We roll different. You will make different decisions based on what you see in scripture, um, the preaching of the gospel. Do it. Go for it. Make much of God in it, though. Do it because God loves those that love him. This is how you express it to him. Make your decisions and go, and your promise that you will find him if you seek him. And the way you seek him is to pray. Lastly, rest in the fact that Jesus is our high priest forever. Hebrews 7. He will always be your connection to God through our prayers. You're never praying without his power. Understand the son makes the request and he is speaking for you. And this is the way that you will begin to make prayer. Not a thing you do for the kingdom. It is the thing you do in the kingdom. Amen. This brings us to the third thing this morning. When all is said and done. So you set the time. Make the time to pray. You move with resolve after you pray. Right. This is not rocket science. Right. It's all in the text. Right. And then thirdly is that you glorify God by trusting in the results that he makes. Not what you do. Whatever you pray for, whatever the answer is, you become okay with it because you start believing this is what he wants. Does that make sense? Now, we are bad about moving against God's will, aren't we? I mean, we'll even be as a people, we would pray for things. How often have you prayed for something, kind of, it didn't work out, and you still worked it to make it happen? Has that ever worked out for anybody in here? But God's gracious, though, right? It doesn't destroy you because he wants you to know him. He wants you to experience that love of him. And picking up in verse 14. So, so how do we... Now, we've taught in Scripture before. Anytime you come to names. Remember, I made poor Jared read all those names. From, was it from Judges or Ezra? It was Ezra, wasn't it? And he said, like, why are names in the Bible? Because they mean something. When the author puts them in there, he wants you to get a point, right? So why is Luke... When you read this text, you got to kind of go, well, why is Luke putting all the names of the disciples in here? Like, what's he trying to show? Without 
just, just, just trying to say, well, this is who he named, right? To make sure that you, because at this point, everybody would have known who they were. So why is he naming them? Let's, let's, let's read that again. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, puts them in Paris, huh? And Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, whom we know at this point became the traitor, right? At this point, when he's writing this, everybody knows, oh, that's Judas, right? They know who that is. So let's talk about the guys that Jesus moves to resolve to call them for two years to follow him and become the fathers of the church. Why we are here today, because without these guys, you're not here. You understand? We are tied in to these guys. Peter, leader of the apostles. Now, why do we call him the leader? Well, because every time there's a list in the Bible about the disciples, guess whose name's first? Peter, that's why. It's not because he was the smartest. Matter of fact, in the, in, the, in the book, Peter is always doing something stupid, isn't he? I'm the best example of Peter. I'm the big dumb guy that opens his mouth first and then thinks later about the actions, right? This is who Peter is. Peter, leader of the apostles, he's rebuked. At one point in Peter's ministry, early on, and Jesus is experiencing, he's, he's Josh, and he looks around to the guys, you remember this scene? He says, Peter, who do people say I am? After everybody answered, right? Some say you're the prophets of old. Some say you're John the Baptist. Who do you say I am, Peter? Peter looks at him and goes straight up and goes, you're the Christ, the Son of God, Messiah. And he goes, blessed are you, Peter, for the only way that you know that is if God revealed that to you. Do you know what happened a few verses later? Jesus says, I must go and die for my people. You know what Peter says? Far be it from you, Lord, that you should ever go and die. Don't ever talk like that again. And what does Jesus tell Peter? Get behind me what? All right, this is my, po- my, my choice for the leader of the church, the guy who's inhabited by Satan. Does, Peter, does Jesus abandon Peter? This is his choice. How many of you have ever felt like you've abandoned the Lord? That you have turned your back on the Lord. Peter was there when Jesus died and turned his back on him. That's the leader of our church. James and John, they're a good story. You know what theirs is? that the Samaritans were coming out to the town one time and they weren't acting like they thought they should. And they look over at Jesus, you, you want us to call down fire and blow up the town? Right? That was their thing. And then in that, their mama was trying to work the back door, trying to get the son's place and put power over the disciples. That's James and John. Simon the Zealot is a, politica, is a political re- uh, rebel. He's the guy that wants to overthrow the Roman government. He's probably there thinking like, how do I help Jesus get in power here? And what's in it for me? You've got Matthew. Remember we talked about him not too long ago? Levi, the hated tax collector. I mean, this is the guy they hated the most in Jewish culture. He's there with them too, right? Thomas the doubter, Judas the greedy and betrayer, fishermen, tax collectors, accountants, rebels without a cause. No theologians among them. None. For Jesus has rejected all the old ways. And he went with guys that had a Sunday school education at most. That was his resolve. When God came down and said, like, can you imagine, now you know what he was struggling with for 12 hours on the mountain with. Are you serious? Peter smells like fish, Lord. Pick him. He's your man. What about, what about James and John? You know their hearts are all in it for themselves. They're going to do you good. Can you imagine the arguing? Now, I mean, it's not mean like sinful, but I mean the back and forth with the Lord and the and the, the, these guys are normal, everyday Joes, Lord. They don't have any education. And the father's like, go do it. So Jesus comes with resolve, full of faith, full of hope in his Lord. And he picks the apostles, those who will go in his name to do what he does. And when he leaves, they will be the leaders, full of the Holy Spirit. And then that, over two years... Jesus never abandons. He never abandons them, right? Even when Peter denied him, who fed Peter fish after the, after the resurrection? It was Jesus. He called them in and forgave him. And because of that, we are here. Let me say that again. Jesus never gave up on the plan. He never gives up on his people. That is your God and you are here. Has Jesus ever given up on you? We give up on ourselves, but not our Lord. Because he's got a plan. He has resolve. He has a spine. 
It's who we need to be like. And it's through the, he, these men that we owe everything to, that who through Christ we owe our existence as a body today. Jesus made the right choice with men that to the world looked like they could not do it. You see, we glorify God by not giving up in our prayers, but trusting that he will come through. Amen? Here's, here's when Luke writes this. When Luke writes this account, many of these men, most of them are dead already. Luke writes this somewhere between mid-70s to 80 AD. Peter at this time has been crucified upside down. He didn't want to be crucified right side up because it, 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 that would make him look anything like his Lord. He wanted, did not want to be associated with his Lord like that. He chooses to be crucified upside down. James, the brother of John, he was the first to die as a martyr in 44 AD, killed by Herod, the king himself. John, almost boiled to death in oil, survives it. He gets exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Thomas, speared in his signs repeatedly in India by the holy priests of that land. James, stoned and then clubbed to death. Andrew, another crucifixion. Philip was scourged to the point of death, and then they went ahead and killed him anyways on the cross at 54 AD. Matthew, the tax collector, killed in North Africa, Ethiopia, speared to death. Thaddeus is crucified, and Simon the Zealot, ends up in Britain, Britain of all places, crucified as well. Fishermen, tax collectors, Sunday school education. And almost all are gone when Luke writes this. And then the end of the book of Acts, which as you know is volume two of Luke's work. What do you see? Luke finishes his work and we find that Paul is at the capital of Rome, about to see Caesar himself. Do you know why? Because the church has spread through the known world. And Caesar must see Paul. And Paul hopes to convert him. Jesus won. He moved with resolve. He had a spine. Because he wrestled with God about these decisions. And he never gave up on his boys. And his, all his boys died for him. Let me ask you... Was Jesus' prayer successful? Was God glorified in what he did, folks? These men are true apostles. They spoke for God. They moved for God. And they did the work of God. All by the power of prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever happens with the things we pray for, family, once released, they are in God's hands, not yours anymore. Keep praying for them, but hold to your resolve for those things you see as God's will. Don't be discouraged by those you pray for that seem to be floundering. God's kingdom advancement is sometimes too complicated to comprehend, but it is a glorious thing to see it come to pass. Amen? You won't get all the answers that you're getting now. You won't know why a no is a no and a yes is a yes, and even what God's end plan is, other than we know that he's coming back when the nation's here. So don't be discouraged by what seems to be unanswered prayers for, of today, for they may be the workings of God for the answers of tomorrow. Prayer is not a way to live in the kingdom, but it's the way, isn't it? In, in closing, this morning, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, Pastor Bill, would you like to go ahead and come up at this point? Uh, what we're going to do as a church, I wanted to give us a real applicable way of how do we become people who don't necessarily just do a way, we think this is a way to do the kingdom, but we become people with the resolve of the Lord, and this becomes the way we do things around here. So in that, we want to share with you a new endeavor in launching a corporate prayer initiative. Yeah. Like, how do we do this? So Bill, Bill's going to show you something cool, so watch. Uh, first, thank you, Pastor Jody, for the sermon today. Um, it... As a body, it's, it's interesting to look at the way God works in people's hearts and the way he brings about change across multiple people at the same time. So it's kind of cool as we look over the last month, God kind of planted a seed in a lot of different people's hearts around prayer at our church. And it's pretty cool that our sermon series ended up where it was today with the, the sermon that we have scheduled today. 
um, and around some of the stuff we're going to talk about with corporate prayer. So I just want to, before I get into this, just bring to your attention that God's doing a, a big movement here. And one of the things he's saying is, I need my people praying. Yes. And so one of the things we uh, just launched this week is we now have uh, on our website a, a new corporate prayer page. And so a couple things we want to be able to do here. One, we want to be for visitors who come to our website to have the opportunity to submit prayers to us because we want to pray for our community. And two, we want to have a way for our church members to make sure that your pastors are hearing from you when you're in need of prayer. And we want you to come to us always in prayer, but we know that um, it's, it's best for us to provide um, easy vehicles for people to submit prayer requests and for those to be in front of us every morning. Um, and so when you go to our website now, you're gonna find a new section in the ministries page that's called um, our prayer ministry. And it's really easy to use. So there's a big red button here that says share your prayer requests. If you click that button, all you gotta do is fill out the form and it adds your prayer request to our list. And Jody and I are going to pray over this every day. Not just Jody and I, but others in the church are going to have the opportunity to go through this and pray for you on a daily basis. And then I get the cool ability to say I prayed for that. See that little gray button right there? And every time someone clicks that gray button, you get a note saying someone prayed for you. It's such a blessing. And so as part of this, um, what's really cool is Jody and I were talking through corporate prayer we had a family in our church contact us and say, hey, we would love to lead a corporate prayer initiative for your church. And you talk about God answering prayers, right? He answered a prayer about prayer, which was pretty cool. Um, and so Becky and Sam Cool stepped up and offered to help lead this ministry. And I'm gonna invite them to come up and talk about what this looks like. While they're coming up, one thing I wanna point out is on your smartphones, you can add this page to your smart home phone screen, and if you click on that link directly, it'll actually take you right to that prayer page so that you can start your morning out each day praying over this list together. All right, Sam, Becky. So understanding we have a lot of kids in our church, uh, meeting in person would be quite a feat uh, every time we wanted to pray as a church. So uh, we prayed about it and uh, Becky learned through a friend that they do something at their church using a conference call line. So uh, Becky's friend gave her, the, um, gave her the website, Becky set up a conference call line. What we'd like to do is starting tomorrow morning at six o'clock, <laughs> Yes. We, want, we want to do a conference call line. 6 a.m., yes. We will, yeah. we will have two different times. One is going to be Monday mornings at 6 a.m. for those who want to be able to get up before their kiddos are up or before they head off to work, okay. that they can get up and we'll be on that call for an hour. Everybody can call in. We'll have that information, the phone number, and then there's an access code to call to get in. Um, and then also we've, so far, I think Thursday evenings were what was the consensus as best for everyone. Um, we were kind of between the frame of 8 and 10, and some people were on both sides, so we decided to go in the middle and go 8.30 to 9.30 for now. Um, and I think as we go, we're going to have to grow these times, so there may be more invaluable, available in the future. Um, and we put together a little two-minute video that goes through some more of this info that will be available for everybody just to watch, just to go through the details of how this is going to work each time. Um, but we will be on the line, and then everybody can just call in and join in to pray with us. Yeah, and to clarify, you don't have to be on the full hour. Right. Because we know that there's a lot of things uh, that happen during your lives. So call in when you can, even if it's just for 15 minutes uh, or for the full hour. Whatever your schedule permits, you could be driving to work and just call on the line. And then you can jump in and pray. Again, those times are Monday mornings from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then Thursday evenings from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. We'll have information posted on this website as well. We'll have a, a one-pager, and we'll also have uh, the conference details, so you can call in. It's, it's very, just like a conference call at work if you've ever done that. Right. So uh, while you guys are up here, uh, what you also should know as a family that um, um, today we are recognizing Sam Cool as a deacon candidate. Okay. And... So obviously that comes with Becky, and so uh, 
so <laughs> you, you, you get a pair, you get a team in this, and, uh, and so in that, as we've done with our other deacon candidates before, which by the way, Bill, did you know all our deacons are out today? Yeah. <laughs> so, so in that, uh, but that's okay, Sam's here now, right? And so in that, though, when, when we pick deacons at the church, what we'd like to do is, is we announce that to you, and we want to give Sam a couple of months so that you, if you have questions for Sam, if you have any character issues with Sam, you are to bring that to the elders of the church so that we may talk about those things together. Does that make sense? Um, it says in scripture that a man who, not actually aspires, because Sam didn't come to us, but Bill and I went to Sam. Because we've been watching Sam for a while about how he's been serving the body lately and loving on the body. And it's time, and as Bill and I have been getting older, we have become hugely aware that we cannot do everything. The body's growing too quick for us. So we need uh, men and women to step up to the plate in leadership. And we've been watching Sam for a while and talking about it. And so this wasn't out of the blue. Uh, but we called Sam to think about those things. He's agreed to think about those things. And so for the next two months, he is on watch with you. So I want you to drive by his house, see what's going on with him. Let me know. Uh, call him at work and go, why aren't you working? And he talks. And, uh, but he's there. Take him out to lunch. Take him, treat, love his family. Go over to your house for dinner and get to know them. Okay? So uh, I want you guys, give you guys opportunity. So sometime after Easter, we'll have this full um, uh, anointing. And so, uh, <laughs> anything else, Bill, you want to add to that? No, I was just going to invite Sam's family up. Yeah, we're going to pray over Sam right now and have Sam his family, and his family come up, if you would, if you don't mind. I know we, maybe you didn't plan for that either. Because <laughs> all things happen through prayer, right? Uh, so I would also invite the body. If the body, if, if you want to come up, lay your hands on Sam and Becky, please do it though at this time. And we're going to pray. If you can sit in your seat and stretch out your hand to this family, that's good too. And I'm going to pray for them. Yeah, everybody's welcome to come up. Yeah, you're, we're, we're, not, we're that type of family here. So. <laughs> and then uh, when I get done praying, we'll actually go... Uh, you all will go back to your seats, but I'll actually go right into communion, okay? And we'll, we'll do it like that as well. So, Father, we thank you. Above all, we praise you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, you are holy, set above all. And right now, in this looking at Sam and Becky and their family, dear Lord... We as a church are moving with resolve. And we are initiating this time for his family to be watched and loved on, and prayed for, and prepared for the work of a deacon. That as this man will come to serve the church in the years to come, um, to lay down his desires for the church, to model for the church his family as they do that, we ask that you would preserve them and their salvation, help them to lead in the areas of prayer that our body so desperately needs, Lord. Give them a full anointing of your spirit and their gifting, Lord. And then highlight those gifts that they need for the future days ahead. Speak to them. Let them be people that clearly hear what you're doing in their lives and the directions you want them to go. Help us as a body to love them. Not to always be a body. Sometimes we bodies can do is take. Help us to give as much as we take. Help us to receive lovingly from them as well. So Father, protect them, guide them, and anoint them for this time of leadership, Lord. Lord Jesus, this is all by your model. We pray this for your name's sake. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So you don't have to go back to your seats, but communion is now open.